Hello YouTube. So in this video I want to talk about the end of science. What might the end of science look like? Well, uh, there are some fairly obvious ways that science might end. For instance, civilization might collapse. Um, you know, maybe climate change, resource depletion, uh, or some unforeseen natural disaster or whatever uh, causes the collapse of technological civilization. Well, that would pretty much be the end of science as we know it. Fair enough. Um, but, you know, let's suppose that technological civilization continues indefinitely. Um, could could science end um, within that context? Well, um, so here's one sort of popular, uh, re well, reasonably popular uh, sort of story about how science might end. So this is the kind of story you find in people like John Horgan. He wrote a book called The End of Science. Basically, uh, it goes like this. Well, we've pretty much dis discovered the answers to all of the big questions. Um, you know, we've figured out the way the world is. Uh, and given that we've now figured out what the facts are, there's just nowhere else to go. Um, obviously, that's a massive simplification. Uh, but, you know, basically, uh, the thought is, look, uh, what we're doing in science is we're trying to figure out the way things work. And scientific progress historically has come about because people were wrong. They were really badly mistaken. And over time, we've corrected those mistakes. And eventually, you know, I mean, if that kind of picture is correct, eventually, we, you know, you, you should expect that you're going to run up against uh, the limits of where that sort of investigation can take you. Namely, you're going to reach the correct answer. So, for instance, uh, the transition from Ptolemaic astronomy to Copernican astronomy was a radical conceptual revolution in our worldview, right? So we went from the view that the Earth is the fixed centre of the universe to a very different picture. And if you think like, well, okay, could that picture change in the future? Well, well, no, we now know that, you know, the Earth orbits the Barry centre of the solar system, and that's that, right? Um, now, of course, there are still plenty of controversies within science. Um, so there's plenty of debate about, you know, the interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, string theory, all of it. You know. So, yes, there's still debate, but, you know, eventually you're just going to either figure out what the facts are, or you're going to run up against... Uh, the limits of instrumentation. Um, so, you know, science proceeds by testing things, by performing experiments, making observations, and eventually, um, you know, like what, like what we have seen, his, like certainly historically, is that as we have probed deeper and deeper into nature, those experiments become more and more complex. They become more and more expensive. Uh, more and more effort is required to probe the ever finer details of nature, and eventually the juice won't be worth the squeeze. Indeed, it may not even be possible to do the squeeze. So uh, I've you know, sometimes said that there are certain theories that in order to test them, you would need particle accelerators the size of a galaxy. Well, we're not going to build a particle accelerator the size of a galaxy. Um, so, you know, in the past, science was driven by sort of gentleman amateurs working independently, funded by private patrons. That's, you know, we wouldn't be able to sustain modern science with that. And, um, you know, eventually we'll get to a point where we just can't, can't continue at all. So, okay, that's sort of one picture of like how science could come to an end. Um, but the thing to notice about that picture is, I think that's a sort of optimistic picture in a certain sense. Um, it's optimistic in the sense that it it kind of tells, it, it gives you a story about the scientific project where like the scientific project is successful, right? The science, so, you know, science um, is this unified enterprise um, where, you, like, okay, either, you know, it, it comes to an end either because you just figure out the facts, um, there's nowhere else to go, uh, or because we just can't afford to uh, create the sorts of instruments that would be required to probe even further. Um, and, okay, in that case, you come to the, to the end of science, uh, the end of science as we know it, at least. Uh, but you can sort of look at this as the completion of a, you know, you have a nice historical narrative where there's like progress and then the end point. Um, so I want to suggest a slightly more pessimistic picture for the end of science, which is uh, the schism, right? Science ends 
by schisming. So intellectual traditions historically have tended to schism, right? Like so when you get an intellectual tradition that lasts for a long enough time and has enough people part of it, it splits, right? I mean, you see this in religions, you know, look at Christianity splitting into the Catholic and Protestant or Islam splits into the Sunni and Shiite. And then of course, these individual traditions tend to split as well. When you look at Catholicism or when you look at Protestantism specifically, you find divergences within those particular traditions. Um, now, science, of course, has been remarkably unified so far. But could there be a similar split? Like, could science schism? Um, well, I mean, I, I don't see why not, right? Like, it's not, I mean, so the question is, is there some feature of science that would, that would prevent it from, from schisming in this way? Um, so I suppose the question is, well, why, like, why has science maintained such remarkable unity so far? Um, one answer to that is just science is relatively young, at least science, you know, like modern science kind of begins in you know, around about the 1600s. Um, it's only been around a few hundred years. Uh, it just hasn't had that much opportunity uh, to split. Um, it's also, I think that a lot of the history of science, it's been kind of unified as a result of opposition to other traditions. Um, so, you know, you have like science versus other traditions like Christianity um, or science versus philosophy, right? Scientists are sort of, uh, you know, staking out their claim to uh, like, this is, you know, we are kind of working together and we're staking out a claim that this is a domain that it is appropriate to ask scientific questions about. Um, where, okay, so, you know, historically like, there were religious objections to uh, the idea of evolution by natural selection, or at least the, you know, the origin of the humanity uh, by, by natural selection. So, you know, you, you find these like religious objections to the attempt to extend science into particular domains. And that kind of thing, like when you have, when you have some opposing force, that can uh, create unity um, among a group. Um, but you know, look, that's contingent, right? And actually today, uh, there seems to be far less opposition in at least of that kind. Science is mainstream. Science is like it's supported by the state, supported by industry. Um, now, of course, there are plenty of people who reject scientific orthodoxy. But the interesting thing about people who reject scientific orthodoxy is that they don't usually frame it as rejecting science. Um, so if you look, for instance, at, um, you know, people who question the contemporary theory with respect to climate change, well, you know, I mean, yeah, you might say, oh, well, that's anti-science, but actually that's not how they themselves will usually present it. If you talk to people who uh, deny the orthodox view of climate change, what they will usually say is not that there's anything wrong with science in itself. What they will usually say is that, ah, well, the reason why the orthodoxy is the way it is, is because science is not being done properly um, or something like that. You know, that, so in other words, people who uh, are on the you know, sort of climate skeptic side will tend to say that what's happened is that, you know, in academia, there's like ideological biases or, you know, there's kind of funding biases or whatever, which which have led um, to violations of appropriate scientific norms. Um, so they're not really opposed to science. Uh, at least that's not how they see themselves. That's not how they present themselves. They would not present themselves as being opposed to science. It's like they, they are saying science isn't being done properly. Um, and of course, that's the claim that defenders of the orthodoxy will make to the people who uh, hold alternative views. That's what the defenders of the orthodoxy will say about climate skeptics as well, right? The defend so people who accept the orthodox view of climate change will similarly say of climate skeptics that no, that's uh, what's in violation of scientific norms. Okay. Anyway, the point is the point is is that like science is it seems like pretty well accepted now, and certainly with respect to everything in the sort of natural world, we all kind of recognise that you know yeah. I mean, if you want to learn uh how things work uh at least with respect to like physical objects and so on and you know you want to you want to understand that you know the stuff that we can perceive and so on 
science is what is going to give you the answer there. Um, so, you know, there's not this opposition that there used to be. Um, so, OK, the question then is like, is there like, so is there something, is there something like necessary to science that would, that would prevent the schism? Is there some essential feature of the scientific project that would keep it unified? And I'm not, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure. Like, is there? Um, there's an interesting, so I'm reading a book at the moment called The Knowledge Machine by Michael Strevens. And um, he suggests that, what's, that what unifies all of science is what he calls the iron rule of explanation. Um, and it seems remarkably trivial. I mean, in some ways it is kind of trivial. Basically, the iron rule of explanation is that um, there's a norm in science that you settle all arguments by empirical testing, okay? So, um, to conduct an empirical test, you perform an experiment where one of, the, like, one of whose possible outcomes can be explained by one hypothesis rather than another. Um, now, of course, that's not necessarily going to be the end of the debate, because uh, any time you perform an empirical test, there's all sorts of different ways of interpreting it. There's always going to be lots of different auxiliary assumptions about, um, you know, how the instruments work and... Uh, a, a, about like the interpretation of data and, and so on. So, you know, like it's not as though there's ever such a thing as a crucial experiment. But the point that Strevens uh, makes is whenever there is a debate within science, the, 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 the assumption that everybody has is, well, we perform empirical tests to try to settle this. Um, so he says that science isn't going to split. It's not going to schism. Because any time there's a debate, there's always something that scientists can agree to do next, right? There's always like a thing, that, a thing they share, which is we do another test, okay? And so no matter how vicious a debate becomes, no matter how much we disagree with each other, we can both agree, if we're scientists, we can both agree, okay, well, let's figure out some test for these alternative theories, right? Let's figure out an experiment, one of whose possible outcomes is better explained by one of these hypotheses. Um, so that's, so, so Streven says, okay, well, that sort of ensures this, this continuity. It ensures that it doesn't split. But it's not really clear to me why that is. I mean, why shouldn't you just have different testing traditions emerge? So why shouldn't you have two separate traditions where all of the mem like the people within each tradition agree among themselves that you um, the way that you decide between uh, the way that you settle arguments is through empirical testing. Um, but like you just have people in this tradition stop trusting or they stop caring about the tests performed in the in the other tradition. So here's one way this might emerge. Um, one of the debates that's currently going on in sort of meta science is about the adequacy of peer review. Um, so there are a lot, of, a lot of scientists now who are questioning whether peer review is uh, actually like reliable, whether it's worthwhile, whether it helps to promote progress in science. Um, and there are, you know, plenty of, uh, you know, like okay, the serious problems with peer review, and there are serious arguments against it. Of course, there are, you know, serious <laughs> reasons to. to, to uh, um, to adopt peer review as well, right? It's a debate, it's a controversy. So, I mean, I can easily imagine, like, it seems like I, I can imagine a future where, okay, you have a group of scientists who end up sort of adopting peer review and trusting peer review. Um, and then you have another group of scientists who are sort of more egalitarian, you know, they say, okay, let's, let's basically give up on peer review and, uh, you know, we'll adopt one of these alternative uh, sort of ways of structuring the scientific institutions. Um, and then these groups just kind of drift apart, um, where one side just inc listens increasingly less to, to the other. I mean, so if we think about this in terms of Stevens's iron rule of explanation, right, you settle all arguments by empirical testing. Well, the thing is, is like, you report the results of empirical tests in peer-reviewed journals. That's what you do at the moment, right? That's how science works at the moment. But if there are increasing numbers of scientists who just stop trusting peer review, and if they are able to, um, you know, to gain power in at least some institutions, then 
I'm not sure why you shouldn't have a split. I, I don't know what's stopping that in principle. So then you, you know, you might end up getting like, like two sciences, you know, the sort of peer review science and the non peer review science. Um, and they might end up looking quite different. Um, so, you know, so this is, this is one, yeah, this is one way that it, it could, it could emerge. Another way that it might emerge, uh, another way that things could split is, you know, science, perhaps like think of things like science funded by private industry versus science in academia. I mean, one might, uh, one might think that there could be a split along those lines. Another possibility. Um, so I think that, like, if you consider the development of science over the 20th century, um, science drove technology, right? Like science had practical applications and there was a lot of pressure to, uh, you know, fund science in order to promote the development of technology. I mean, you know, you, you fund physics in order to get things like the atom bomb. And in the development of the atom bomb, that involved constructing these explanatory theories of the world. Um, so you had a, a sort of connection between practical application and the construction of a, you know, of a worldview, of a theory, uh, a theory that uh, tells us what the world is like beyond the phenomena. So there's these sort of two, there's these two parts of science where science gives us theories of how the world works and science allows us to fulfill practical goals and construct technology. And these have kind of been developing in tandem. Um, now, the thing is, is that it's not obvious why that would have to be the case forever. So in particular, um, so some, there have been some people who've suggested that we might be approaching a kind of end of theory. Um, so it could be that as a result of big data and increasingly powerful AI systems, it might be that like big data plus AI will be able to just find patterns in things without relying on explanatory theories. So you can just kind of read off the patterns from the data. You don't have to model the underlying laws. You basically don't have to construct an explanatory theory. So maybe you will see a split where like there's the aspect of science which focuses on explanation and intelligibility and constructing theories of how the world works. And then that just splits off from science as practical control. Um, you know, so when once you have if if it's true that like okay by having you know big data plus ai we can just you know we can just get hypotheses that allow us to fulfill these practical um these practical goals without constructing theories of the underlying phenomena then science then that no longer needs to guide belief that no longer you know the practical application no longer needs to guide our world view um so anyway those were some you know, ways in which we might see a sort of split, a schism. Uh, and so that would be the end of science as as a unified enterprise, um, the end of science as a sort of single thing. And the reason why this is kind of, you know, maybe relevant and worth thinking about is, you know, I said that, like, this is perhaps a somewhat more pessimistic picture of how science might end. Um, and the reason why it's maybe a bit more pessimistic is because, at least from the point of view of um well, I, I say maybe it's not so pessimistic. Pessimistic from the point of view of people who are pro-science, let's say. Um, you know, in philosophy, uh, there's a lot of people who think that we should defer to the sciences. Um, or at least we should have a kind of respect for the sciences. We, you know, philosophical theories ought not to conflict with the results of sciences. Like there's some sense in which our worldview today is guided by science. Um, and if we find if science splits, if it schisms, then, well, I mean, what would it mean to like you might like what would it mean to defer to that? Uh, well, there's two different things. There's two competing traditions. Um, so certainly it wouldn't be as simple as just saying, oh, well, you know, we so I guess the, the way that what we want to say today is, is, well, you know, we have this um, this kind of project science. It's this basically unified project. And we just believe 
the best theories that are produced by science, right? So our worldview today is guided by the best theories in science. Um, and, you know, if science ends as a result of just figuring out all the facts or running up against the limits of instrumentation, then you can sort, you can still accept that, you know, you can say, well, yeah, right. Uh, our worldview is guided by the results of science. And, you know, maybe science isn't really producing any results anymore, but that's just because we've figured out what the facts are. Whereas if science ends by schisming, by splitting into different traditions, um, well, you know, it's okay. Which, which one do you choose? You would, I think, end up in a similar situation to, uh, to people in, you know, the sort of earlier modern period when they started to encounter other religions. So like, you know, when, when, <clears throat> you know, when, when society is just governed by like a single religion, then it's like, okay, that's our worldview. You know, we, we just believe what's stated in this book and that guides our worldview and we can feel very comfortable with that. But then by the time you get to like the 1500s, 1600s, suddenly there are all of these alternative religions. Which one do we trust? Which one do we believe? Um, you know, we no longer have some single worldview that we accept that, and you know, you end up with a more sort of skeptical, uh, you're, you're in a more skeptical position. Uh, suddenly it seems like no particular, no particular religion has a privileged claim to the, tr tr to the truth. And if science schisms in some of the ways I've suggested, then maybe you'd be in a position where you're like, none of these traditions really have a, have a privileged claim to the, to the truth. Um, anyway, uh, those were just some thoughts about the end of science, and uh, that's all I am going to talk about today. Bye, everybody.